In this Q&A video, we're going to answer the question, what is high risk task area emergency lighting and how do you provide it? Now, just before we explain the answer to this question, please be aware that this video is one of a series that we've made on the subject of emergency lighting in association with Robus. They can be viewed individually, or you can click the link in the description below to view them as part of a free online training package to help you with your CPD and you'll receive a certificate to prove that you've completed the course. High risk task area lighting is very neatly defined for us in the electrician's guide to emergency lighting in the definitions section. It states that this kind of lighting is that part of emergency escape lighting that provides illumination for the safety of people involved in a potentially dangerous process or situation and to enable proper shutdown procedures for the safety of the operator and other occupants of the premise. A classic example of this might be a kitchen where you've got open flames, sharp knives being used close to people's fingers, pots of scalding liquids and a fairly high pressure intense environment. Of course, this is just one example. Other places might be workshops in industrial settings or manufacturing environments. One often overlooked area is in control rooms where machinery and processes are controlled from. While that space may not present a high risk in itself, it's critical the lighting remains at a sufficient level to allow the shutdown processes to take place in order to prevent danger elsewhere. In all these places, if the regular lighting is lost, then it's essential to maintain people's safety. Notice in the definition, the thought that part of the reason for this type of lighting is to allow shutdown procedures to take place. So this type of lighting is not designed to keep people working while the main lighting is off. First of all, we need to figure out how to identify where in a building would need to be classified as a high risk task area. This is done by carrying out a risk assessment, which should be done for the building as a whole, but the same process applies to high risk areas as well. The Society of Light and Lighting suggests the following process. Identify potential fire hazards in the workplace, sources of ignition, fuels, work processes. Identify the location of people at significant risk in case of fire. Who might be in danger? Employees, visitors and why? Evaluate the risks. Are safety measures adequate or does more need to be done? Fire detection, warning, means of fighting fire, means of escape, fire safety training of employees, maintenance and testing of fire precautions. Carry out improvements. Record findings and actions taken, prepare emergency plans, inform, instruct and train employees. Keep assessment under review, revise it when situation changes. In addition to this, the Industry Committee for Emergency Lighting, or ICEL, part of the Lighting Industry Association, have published a technical statement highlighting the importance of collaboration between various bodies and individuals when producing the fire risk assessment. The fire risk assessor should take on board information from the user or duty holder for the building, requirements from the insurers, requirements from building control and legislation, and also, very importantly, fire protection system supplier. If you look at the box in the image depicting this information, you can see that includes emergency lighting and sign suppliers. If the risk assessment identifies areas that would require high risk task area emergency lighting, then those areas will need to comply with very specific requirements. These can be found in BSEN 1838 and are summarized for us under subheading 4.6 of the Electrician's Guide to Emergency Lighting as follows. A. In areas of high risk, the maintained illuminance on the reference plane shall be not less than 10% of the required maintained illuminance for that task. However, it shall be not less than 15 lux. It shall be free of harmful stroboscopic effects. Okay, so let's break that down. The starting point for this requirement is the reference plane. When lighting design is carried out, it's important to know where the light levels are being measured. For corridors, it's usually the floor. If you're designing lighting for a classroom or an office, you'd probably think about the light levels at desk height and so on. This area that you measure the light on is referred to as the reference plane. For high risk task areas, it's literally all about the area where the high risk task is taking place. So if it was an industrial kitchen, you might set the reference plane on top of the gas burner and over any workstation nearby. This would allow for the safe shutting down of the flames and removal to a stable surface of any hot pans and sharp knives. So on this reference plane, the average illuminance, or how much light is falling on that area, should be at least 10% of the illuminance level required for that task when the lighting is working fine, if not more. So using our example of a commercial kitchen space, the recommended lighting level will vary depending on the exact circumstance, but a common value found in the guide to lighting is 500 lux. So in an emergency situation, the lighting level on the task area would need to be at least 10% of that value, so 50 lux. The requirement continues to state that the illuminance level should never be less than 15 lux in a high risk task area. So if a task required 100 lux under normal lighting levels, 
applying the 10% rule would not be acceptable as this would bring the emergency lighting level to 10 lux. It would still need illuminating to at least 15 lux to comply. Interestingly, this information is repeated in the SLL Guide to Lighting, but elsewhere in that document it seems to contradict itself. It states that the required emergency lighting level in a kitchen should be 15 lux on the reference plane. So how to understand this seeming discrepancy? Well, it makes sense if you view the two pieces of information as complementary. In a kitchen, there's lots of different tasks going on with different levels of risk involved. So while the 15 lux value would be okay in lower risk areas in a kitchen, for the specific higher risk tasks, you'd apply the more stringent value. We'll find a similar situation in a moment when we discuss how long the emergency lighting should stay on for. The next requirement is B, the uniformity of the high risk task area lighting. Illuminance shall be not less than 0.1. So we're still looking at the reference plane here and the specific values for uniformity. Uniformity is all to do with how evenly spread out the light is. If you have a single light source in a room, this will usually cause a bright spot directly below it and then the level will drop off as you get further away from the source. If you have more than one light source in a room, then the picture becomes a little more complex, but you will still have points in the room that are brighter and some that are dimmer. The type of uniformity in this requirement is found by taking the lowest illuminance value on the reference plane and dividing that by the average illuminance. This value will always be between zero and one. The closer to one, the better the uniformity. So the requirement for uniformity of 0.1 or above here should not be too difficult to achieve across a task area reference plane and is likely to be achieved with the use of a single fitting. Next up, we get a requirement that might not be as familiar as some of the information we've looked at so far. It reads, C, disability glare shall be kept low by limiting the luminous intensity of the luminaires within the field of view. These shall not exceed the values in Table 1, or Table 4.2 in this guide, within the zone 60 degrees to 90 degrees from the downward vertical at all angles of azimuth. Okay, so again, let's do some unpicking. We've got here a reference to disability glare. This doesn't have anything to do with people who have accessibility issues with their sight, but rather it's defined in the SLL lighting guide as glare that impairs the vision of objects without necessarily causing discomfort. Disability glare can be produced directly or by reflection. So it's referring to the disabling effect that glare could have on someone trying to carry out a task. Glare is simply the measurement of how bright a light source is compared with its surroundings. This would be a problem at night or in a room without any natural light if the lighting was to fail, as the emergency sources would sit against a very dark background, meaning that it could cause the human eye to effectively overload and make it difficult to see what they're doing. Not good in an emergency situation in a high-risk task area. So glare needs some consideration. It goes on to add that the glare values shall not exceed the values taken from table 4.2 in the guide. In the right hand column, we see the maximum values in luminous intensity we're allowed with fittings mounted at different heights. Now notice though the additional requirement in indent C. It states that these values are only applicable in the zone 60 to 90 degrees from the downward vertical. So you can see on this diagram that it only applies within this zone. The reason for this is that glare varies depending on where you're standing in relation to the light. If you're under a light source staring straight up at it, then you're going to get glare, it can't be avoided. So this restriction only applies within those areas that we've shown on the diagram. It also adds the comment about this applying at all angles of azimuth. This just refers to the horizontal angle you're viewing it from, so wherever you stand around the fitting, the restriction to glare applies. The easiest way to make sure that you get this right is just to talk to the manufacturer of your chosen fittings. You'll often find they're manufactured to comply with this requirement anyway. Failing that, you can calculate glare on a piece of free software like Dialux or Relux. The next requirement is found in indent D and reads, in order to identify safety colours, the minimum value for the colour rendering index RA of a lamp shall be 40. The luminaire shall not substantially subtract from this. This is just a measure of how well a light source shows the true colour of an object and with most modern LED emergency light sources, they'll have values well above 40, which is not a spectacularly difficult value to achieve. Then indent E refers to the minimum duration shall be the period for which the risk exists as agreed with the duty holder or responsible person. Again, we find this curious seeming contradiction in the SLL guide to lighting under subheading 3.2.1.3 on high risk task areas. We find similar direction that minimum duration is the period for which the risk exists to people. 
This makes sense in both documents because if you set a blanket arbitrary minimum duration that the emergency lighting is on for, you run the risk of that either not being long enough or much longer than is needed. However, we also find this direction later in the document in table 3.4 where we have the direction about minimum illuminance. It shows that for kitchens and other areas we would need the specific value of 30 minutes. So which is it? 30 minutes or the time period for which the risk exists? Well, again, view them as complementary directions. If you aim for 30 minutes and the risk period is shorter than this, then you've built in a safety factor. And if the risk period is longer than 30 minutes, then use that value instead. It's hard to go wrong if you go for the more stringent requirement. The rise of the LED as the most common light source means that it's much easier to achieve long periods of emergency illumination anyway. Finally, we come to indent F. High risk task area lighting shall provide the full required illuminance permanently or within 0.5 seconds depending upon application. Now this is a bit of a throwback to the old days of emergency lighting when we were using fluorescent lights instead of LEDs. There could be a period of time, especially on non-maintained fittings, when it would take a while for the tubes to warm up and achieve full brightness. Or if the emergency lighting was fed from a backup generator, it could take even longer for the lights to come on. In a high-risk task area, the lights being off even for a few seconds could be disastrous to both people and processes. So this regulation was used to reduce this period that it could be off for. Again though, with the transition to LEDs, it's become pretty easy to achieve very short transition periods, even on standard fittings. So there we go, that's what we mean by high-risk task area emergency lighting and how we provide it. But you may be wondering what the legal requirements for individuals are for emergency lighting. Well, to find out more about that, check out this video right here, or click the link in the description below to watch it as part of a free training package to help you with your CPD, and you'll receive a certificate as well. For further information on emergency lighting from Robust, check out their latest catalogue, or get in touch with them via email on info at All that remains in this video is to say, thank you very much for watching.